Hello, today we will be reviewing a book written by Dan Clausen and Max Page titled The Future of Higher Education. Rutledge Press recently published this book as of 2011 in New York. The book is a short, engaging read at only 53 pages with a reference, glossary, and index section. It is a text meant for undergraduate curricula listed within the study of social problems as part of the larger discipline of sociology. This book is part of a larger academic series framing 21st century social issues, offering readable, teachable thinking frames to our contemporary social problems. Dr. Clausen received his PhD in sociology in 1978 from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Prior to this, he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology with magna cum laude distinction from Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri in 1970. His research interests include labor movements, work hours and schedules, corporatization of the university, healthcare and social movements. Dr. Page received his PhD in history in 1995 from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to this, he received a Bachelor of Arts degree in History with magna cum laude distinction from Yale University in 1988. Dr. Page teaches and writes about the design, development, and politics of cities and architecture. The book is broken down into seven chapters and includes a series forward, preface, and acknowledgments. The text also includes both a reference section and a sociological glossary. In Chapter 1, The Introduction, Dr. Clausen and Page discuss an existing consensus in the U.S. that every American needs a college education. However, in the past three decades, the U.S. has seen a general decline in our overall higher education system. The author states, a nation which once had a higher education system that was the envy of the world has, in a few short decades, weakened students of all racial, ethnic, and class groups. In short, higher education is in crisis. Dr. Clausen and Page argue that much of the decline witnessed in higher education is from the loss of public funds and an overall paradigm shift in the U.S. towards neoliberalism. In Chapter 2, The Lay of the Land, five points for thinking about college students and the landscape they navigate are provided. Almost three out of four university students are in public institutions. More than a third of total college enrollments are at two-year institutions, which generally means community college. Therefore, a majority of students entering the system do so at a community college. Well over a third of the students are part-time, many are working to support themselves or raising children. Students come in all ages, not just 18 to 21, including many over the age of 40. And finally, there is a new rapidly growing sector in higher education, for-profit colleges and universities. In Chapter 3, Who Governs the University, the authors reveal the gradual transformation within higher education from faculty governance guided by academic values towards an administrative business focused on self-funding and rankings. With the increased focus on self-funding and college rankings, profitable scholarship becomes paramount in importance and significance to teaching and student development. The resulting structures create winners and losers from the start and move away from more holistic goals of lifelong learning. In Chapter 4, Who Pays?, the authors discuss a shift in the costs associated with higher education from institutions and the state to students and their families. As Dr. Clausen and Page poignantly describe, where once public higher education was affordable, today it represents an ever-growing strain on families and on students. Four factors are suggested for current record high tuition costs. The importance of college educations in society giving institutions market power. The increased inequality in incomes, which means that the affluent can afford to pay high tuition costs. The university as business model leading to a competition for and emphasis on the most affluent students. And most importantly, the decrease in government support for affordable public higher education. In Chapter 5, Who Goes?, the authors illustrate three main obstacles to the current system of higher education. Students come from different backgrounds students having unequal opportunities, and the fact that we live in a nation that has not yet made a true commitment to equal higher education. Pell Grant students, those with low-income needs, are often restricted from the more affluent or high-ranked schools altogether. The authors describe this saying the bottom quarter of the population, indeed the bottom half, is no more likely to get a college degree today than they were in 1970. In Chapter 6, Who Works?, the authors explain that 3.6 million people work at colleges and universities, making them a key component of the U.S. economy. Dr. Clausen and Page go on to note the Walmarting of public higher education occurring for these workers, saying, over the last three decades, colleges and universities have been Walmarted, a process very much associated with the university as business model and our society's general turn to neoliberalism.
In this climate of business as usual, tenured faculty present a threat to the institution by their ability to speak out in dissent against profiteering actions. The authors conclude their book with Chapter 7, Choosing a Future, and call for transforming the U.S. system of public higher education and arguing against the current dominant vision of viewing colleges and universities' goal as increasing revenues and ranking. What we need now is to move away from the simplistic idea that there just isn't money to fund public institutions. Instead, we should call for free higher education, lifelong learning, and democracy on university campuses today. However, we live in a world where suggesting such a thing seems ridiculous. So the question remains, how can we afford free higher education? As the authors describe it, 45 or even $100 billion a year is not a trivial expense, but it is far less than the cost of the Bush era tax breaks for the top 5% of the population, estimated at $1.3 trillion, or the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, estimated at $1 trillion, or even the bank bailout, estimated at a minimum of $800 billion. They ask the reader to consider just one of the many possible sources as potential for funding free higher education. A key takeaway from this short book is that we need to work together in order to change the mission of our institutions of higher education back to their foundational roots in teaching, knowledge, service, and development, as opposed to the current trends of profits, enrollments, revenues, and rankings. This book's strength lies in its analysis of longitudinal government data on public funding of higher education accumulated over the past 30 years. Furthermore, as a work of public sociology, its strengths reside in the author's ability to make the material readable, digestible, and entertaining to a wide array of audience, both inside and outside the academy. A critique of this book is that the authors fail to discuss recent changes in the U.S. public higher education around online learning, since it always appears linked to neoliberalism, neglecting online programs at affordable costs like those at community colleges, which offer access for many students who cannot attend such courses in person. In examining recent trends to profit from higher education, the authors remind readers of the potential that still exists for free public higher education. If only we as citizens can make this a priority to politicians and decision makers. It was only 30 years ago that students could afford to attend college and pay their own way working approximately 10 hours a week at a minimum wage job. As a short and engaging read, I recommend this text for anyone interested in the privatization of higher education or desire to make access and equity the forefront of concerns for colleges and universities today. I thank you for listening. As always, take care of yourself and others, and farewell until next time.